Our next speaker is Matt Thornhill, partner at the Institute for Tomorrow here in Richmond. Matt? So my organization is actually based here in Richmond, and I'm delighted to be here because I usually travel all over the country and all over the world. And the fact that I didn't have to go through TSA this morning <laughs> made this totally awesome for me. And if you want to follow me, you can follow me at Winning Tomorrow. But we work for all kinds of companies in all kinds of categories. We are not housing experts. We're consumer experts. We understand where the consumer is going. So I was asked to come talk about where the consumer is going. What we do with a lot of these organizations is we try to help them really get prepared for what's coming by explaining the trends that are happening through the lens of the people who are shaping those trends. The people who are our next generation of housing buyers and housing consumers is an example of how we would apply it today. I'm not going to tell you when the drones are going to deliver the pizza. I'm not a futurist that talks about you know, when autonomous vehicles are coming. They're coming. But that's not, we try to focus more on, we call it the future we already know. The big demographic trends, the big societal trends, the big cultural trends that are already happening and are going to just keep happening. And I will tell you, change is already here. You heard it this morning. She was talking about how Airbnb doesn't own any beds. Or how the largest media company in the world is Facebook. They don't create any media. They don't create any content. My favorite example is 10 years ago, I remember teaching my kids, you don't meet strangers on the internet, and you never get in a stranger's car. That's Uber. <laughs> we all do it now. We don't even think twice about it. So today is already vastly different from just 10 years ago. But industry after industry, if in fact, if you're still operating your business the same way you did 10 years ago, you're behind. You're behind. The world has moved on. And in this particular industry, oh my gosh, I have the slide. I don't have the Jesus slide, but I have a house built in 1913 and a house built in 2013. Which is which? You can't tell because we still do it the same way. The carpenter drops the hammer down and says, okay, that's where the uh, electrical receptacle is going to go. Electric receptacle. It's just like that. It never changes. Never changes. But it's got to change because the consumer has moved. And the consumer wants a different product, and we've got to deal with a different product. So I'm going to help you understand where the next generation of how, who they are, what they want, what, where they're looking, how it's going to happen, and the why, because the why is important. So to start with, the who is, is easy, except you're probably going to be surprised when I tell you who the who is. America has changed. Our demographics are changing rapidly. And yes, we are growing more diverse. That's one of the changes. But the other thing is, is we're growing older. We're growing older as a country. We're going to go from 54 million people over the age of 65 to 74 million, 73 million by 2030 in just 10 years. What's that going to look like? Well, where do we keep all our old people today? We conveniently store them down in Florida, right? <laughs> well, right now in Florida, they have one in every five people walking around is over 65. It's going to be that way here. In Virginia, it's going to be that way everywhere in the country. Florida is going to be at 30% over 65. So we're getting older. The, the other thing that's happening, it's the baby boom generation getting older. The other thing that's happened really started in the late 60s when birth control came on the market. We stopped making babies. We're not making as many kids as we used to. Demographers like to talk about, or social scientists like to talk about, the population age pyramid because we've always had more young people, fewer at young life, fewer to middle life, uh, midlife. And yeah, we get people to 80, 90 and above, but not that many. And they put it on a chart. They put men on one side, women on the other. That's why they call it the pyramid or triangle. This is America in 1960. That's the baby boom at the bottom. Watch what's happened since then. This is 1970, 1980. 1990. Are you noticing a trend? 2000, 2010, looking ahead, 2020, 2030. Where's my triangle? Where's my pyramid? It's gone. And it's not just temporarily gone, it's permanently gone. Permanently gone. The Census Bureau says, yeah, the shape is this, we're going to call it a pillar. It's like, why are you stuck in like 2,000-year-old construction things? How about it's the Empire State Building? Because we're going to have equal numbers of youth, young adult, midlife, and a lot of people at 85 and beyond. Where are they going to live? What do we need to be building for? Who is the next generation of housing consumers in America? In Virginia already, we're already at pillar 
stage, and it's just going to get taller. The roof line is going to get flatter as the boomers continue to grow older. So the who, the who is all ages. Don't just think about building for first-time home buyers. You're going to need to build affordable housing for people in their 60s and 70s who don't have incomes anymore and need a place to live and didn't save for retirement. They had a 401k, they bought a sailboat. <laughs> so it isn't just families who are buying homes. In fact, here's the other interesting statistic. One in four homes bought last year was sold to a single adult, single head of household. And that doesn't mean it's only a one person household, it's just one head of household. Do we develop product for that market? Are we paying attention to it? I'll give you some perspective. It's also going to be older. Back 20 years ago, in the year 2000, about one in four people who were 55 to 74 didn't have a spouse or partner. And it was about five, just under 5 million people. You know what it is today? Two out of five, it's 40%, don't have a spouse or partner today, and it's about 28 million people. 40% of boomers don't have a spouse or partner. Where are they going to live? Who are they going to live with? What kind of home can they afford? What kind of place do they need? So the future is not just all ages, it's increasingly single. That's the who. The what? What do they want to buy? Well, we all know. We, we're going to learn about it today, a new product that is out there. Essentially, in the built environment, the stick-built environment, we're a different square footage based on how old you are, the starter homes, then about standard through most of your life, and then a smaller home when you get older. Interesting, it hadn't really changed that much what has changed is where we want this home to be and the situation. It used to be, back 15 years ago, it was, I want to be in a house with a large yard where I have to drive places to go. That was the uh, majority. Since then, this is a study that the National Association of Realtors does every year, it's now 53% say, no, I want a small yard with easy to walk. Now, the other big change is this, this uh, you know, we're, we're not all going to go to tiny homes. But the idea of the time, here, what's the most interesting thing in that photograph? The bicycles. How insane is that to go in a 300 square foot home with kids? But that's how desperate we are to find suitable living, affordable living. The, again, I, this was the home builders asked, are you interested in buying a tiny home? And 53% said, well, maybe. And younger people, yeah, maybe, because I can't afford anything else. So the what? is changing. Those sensibilities need to be applied to what we're building. So this rejection of manufactured homes in the past, that bias may be washed away when we see all these really cool tiny homes. Now, I don't want a tiny home, but I want those ideas in my home, perhaps. And the other thing we have to build in is universal design. Universal design. For 80 years, Heinz put ketchup in the bottle, and they said, we don't care how you get it out. In fact, <laughs> good luck with that, was their attitude because they had factories and that's how they did it. And now they flipped the bottle, they changed it, now anyone from 5 to 85 can get their ketchup. Universal design concepts has to be applied to housing and it hasn't been. We worked on a project about 10 years ago with AARP trying to help them develop with the builders and others this concept around better living design. We, we said in the future every home will be designed and built for everyone at every age and ability. That future starts here now. It didn't get traction. ARP stopped funding it and supporting it. But that concept of universal design needs to be, and that doesn't mean it has to be utilitarian. It just has to work. The old way we built was just the way we built. You got to redesign and redo it so it can work for people of all ages and abilities, especially older adults. The where. Where are we going to build? Well, we, again, we heard that a little bit this morning, too. Where, there's, a, I think, a, Mayor Stoney mentioned it. There is a 100-year trend in America where we've gone out of suburban and, and rural, I mean, out of rural to more suburban and urban. And in Virginia has mapped along with the United States in that shift towards more urban living. You can look at the numbers. The Cooper Center on Demographics at UVA uh, collects the Census Bureau numbers and analyzes it for Virginia. Uh, just in the last, since 2010 to 2017, Virginia has grown by 467,000, but if you look at the 11 metropolitan markets in Virginia, that's grown by 493,000, which means rural Virginia has shrunk, has shrunk. So these 11 markets is 106% of the growth. That's where people are moving. That's where you need to be building, because that's where they want to be. And it's actually 
it's tighter than that. It's, it's Northern Virginia, it's RVA, and it's uh, Tidewater Hampton Roads. It's this golden crescent, it's called, in Virginia, is where people want to move, where they want to live. Yes, maybe some down in Roanoke and Charlottesville, but the majority of the growth is there. In fact, the blue counties are the ones that have shrunk since 2010. So the exodus is continuing. So where do people want to live? Millennials tell us in surveys, after surveys, I want to live in an urban environment. And we all think, oh, they want to be downtown. No, they don't mean downtown. They just mean some place where they can work, live, and play in the same place, where they don't have to get in a car, where they can get somewhere pretty quickly. So you have to understand what's going to work in your community, what's going to work in, rural, in the Shenandoah Valley, what's going to work in Tidewater, what's going to work in Richmond. And you have to think about this, that 53% want smaller yards. And what they really want are these 15-minute livable communities, it's called, where I do have access to everything with 15-minute travel time, whether it's in my car or transit or bike or even walking. Now, in Richmond, we think it's downtown, but it's not. There are 14 activity centers growing and prospering around our entire region. And people are building new ones, like Libby Mill Midtown. It's a mixed-use residential community that's being built here and developed, and they're selling out like that. Every new product they put up, they sell, because it offers that, that livable community aspect to it. How? How are people going to be able to afford houses? You just saw the number, $394,000 for a typical house sold, stick-built house. Who can afford that? Not millennials. Not the youngest folks. There was an article Monday in the Wall Street Journal that says millennials are playing catch-up. They're in worse financial shape than every preceding living generation and may never recover. Thanks to student debt, thanks to the timing of the recession, they're just up the creek without a paddle. That's why they're living in your basement, <laughs> you know? But the, you know, the percentage of children earning more than their parents has been on a steady decline. Wage growth has ticked up in the last couple of years a, a little bit, but the overall trends in the last 20 is not good. And we, we're, we're living on the edge. People just don't have money. They don't have money to just handle a $400 expense. It's shocking how unprepared we are. The wealth gap has doubled in the last 25 years, 30 years, from old and young. And half of the, of the annual expenditures of, of young, middle-income people is on housing and transportation. That's not sustainable. Now, we have a generation that's interested in having a smaller footprint. And thanks to the sharing economy, doesn't need to own everything. I'll borrow it. I don't need to have a room for a riding lawnmower. I'll borrow the neighbors. You know, we'll share stuff. It's a different mindset. So the how is clearly we have to be affordable. And the last <clears throat> is the why. You've got to remember that what you're building is in a home. It's a community. It's a community. And millennials especially want to be in community. Everybody wants to be in these 15-minute communities. And community develop, creating great places for people to live where they can afford to live brings them in. And if that brings them in, that brings in economic development. Because the economic development model has flipped. Economic development now is community development. Because homes are where jobs spend the night. And jobs are following people. In the old days, you'd develop the site, you'd get the company to come, and people would move to that community to go work at that company. Now the company says, I ain't coming unless you got people living here already. Because we're in a war for workers. We're at 3.6% unemployment. If you don't have workers available, and if you don't have homes for the workers, you don't, you're not there. So part of the deal is, as builders is we've got to think about we're not just building homes, we're building community. We've got to create infrastructure, things, places to go. We've got to create events, things to do. And again, Libby Mills is a great example. They do that. They've got trails and they've got events. They've got a reason to come live there. They've made it not just about the apartment or the condo or the single family home. It's about the community. Very smart. That's their why. So that's what I wanted to share with you. I want to end, though, with circling back to maybe the biggest point I want you to take away with today. Virginia's growing. We're in a prosperous state. Not all states are, are projected to grow. We're, we've got pretty robust growth. And here's the thing. I saw that number, and then I saw another number not too long ago, and I said, wait a second, that doesn't make sense. The IRS tracks where people move based on where your tax return is. And Virginia's net migration, this is people moving in, people moving out. We had more people move out in the last four years 
then move in. It's like, wait a second, how can we be growing? So the people at the Cooper Center at UVA said, oh, well, we can explain that. Our population's not declining, it's growing, but it's now dependent on having more births than deaths to continue growing. It's not from people moving in, it's from more babies being born. That's not right. We're not having more babies. Last year in America, we had 3.7 million babies born in all of America. 10 years ago, it was 4.3. We're having fewer babies, so it's not that. You know what it is? It's people not dying. <laughs> That's what we have. No one's leaving it, leaking out the bottom of the bucket. No one knew it was coming in, but no one's getting out. So let's look at the numbers. Here's, here's Metro Richmond. It's about 1.3 million today. It's going to be 1.4 million by 2030 is the projection. But where's that 137,000 come from? 60% of it, 80,000, is the 65 plus. Only, only 10, or I guess 15% is that 20 to 64. That's the people moving in. And the top line is the, the babies being born. Every year babies are born. Yeah, sure, we get more babies. So it's not more people coming here. It's fewer people moving on. It's people living longer. And they need houses. So as you think about the next generation of housing consumer, it may not be the young family. It may not be the first time buyer. It may be this huge group of older adults who are desperate for affordable housing. They're not going to Westminster Canterbury. They can't afford it. So where are they going to live? Who's going to build for them? Big opportunity in the middle of really middle income affordable housing. Thank you very much.